What if you could help others to find the power to heal themselves, physically, emotionally, and spiritually? When I started teaching my classes, it was in 2002, and I was just doing the past life regressions and contacting the subconscious part. But then as the time went on and we found how powerful this was and what we could do with it, a lot of the students began saying, you know, advanced past life regression doesn't really tell what it's all about. This is so much more than that. We think you should change the name. So it was a few years ago, we decided to change the name to Quantum Healing Hypnosis Technique. And this is the healing technique that we've now been teaching it, well, since 2002, that's 12 years. What if you could time travel with them? Visit mythical places or angelic realms, other worlds, other galaxies. Help others to speak to their higher selves. You can. Dolores has taught thousands of people from across the world how to use QHHT and now you can learn her method by going directly to DoloresCannon.com and don't forget to mention the discount code MORETALKS. Established over 100 years ago, Watkins Books is one of the world's oldest and leading independent bookshops specializing in esoterica. We have the widest selection of esoteric books in the UK, and our friendly and knowledgeable staff are here to assist you in a unique ambience of our shop. So come and visit us in the heart of London as we're open every day. The More Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. The comments and views expressed on The More Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the view of Kevin Moore, The More Show, or this radio station and its affiliate or sponsors. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Broadcasting from the UK and across the world online. You're now watching the UK's only alternative late night talk show. And I'm your host, Kevin Moore. For the next hour, I'll be covering subjects that will open up your mind and provide you with information you may have never heard before. On today's show, I'm about to be joined by my guest, Dr. Penny Satari. Now, Penny has worked as a nurse in a British hospital for over 21 years, 17 of those being in intensive care. She is highly experienced and skilled in her role as an intensive care staff nurse, and has conducted unique and extensive research into near-death experiences of her patients. In 2005, she was awarded a PhD for her research into NDEs. Dr. Satari's work has received worldwide attention and media coverage. She has spoken at many conferences both nationally and internationally, and her work has received the attention of Prince Charles. Dr. Penny Satari, welcome to the show. Hi, Kevin. It's great to be here with you today. Thanks ever so much for joining us today. Um, you know, I was surprised you, you, you've come on, you've come back um, um, with a new book as well. And um, I, I'm guessing there's always new material that comes through uh, when, when doing this work. Oh, there is. You know, when my, my first book, The Wisdom of Near-Death Experiences, that came out in February 2014 and after that I was just bombarded with thousands of emails literally and uh, it's a full-time job in itself rep responding to the emails and going through them so I've got such great material but I've still got a lot of unanswered emails. I've currently got about 14,000 320 or so emails that I have not had chance to reply to yet so I've got some great cases there and some great um, future future research 
So, um, yeah, it's never ending, really, this stuff, you know, and the more I kind of um, learn about it, the more questions it raises. So the more I, I, I'm really interested and keen to do more research in this area. Absolutely, absolutely. And I really like this book as well. It's a, it's a you know, ever such a tiny book, just holding it up to the camera now. Um, but it's an easy sort of pocket book just to take with you as well. Um, did did uh, you have some input into the, the concept of this book? Yeah, well, the di design was from Watkins, uh, the publishers, and they had the ideas for it. But I think it's great because it's the kind of book that you can just dip into, you know, and you can go from page to page. You don't need to necessarily read it in order either, you know. So if you've got a specific point that you want to look up, you can just kind of flick through it and go to the relevant part of the book. So it's a great idea of Watkins and it's part of their whole series for the Mind, Body, Spirit uh, series that they're doing. So there's lots of other different books as well on really fascinating topics. Right, right. OK, well, yeah. It, and um, like you, as you've just said there, you know, this topic is, is ongoing. And um, yeah, I was reading somewhere in the book as well about near death experiences uh, in other countries and how they're perceived from different uh, religious stance points. Um, and that, that was fascinating. It is, yes, because they t they tend to have the same kind of elements as the the UK um, NDEs, but they are often interpreted in slightly different ways, you know, so that is fascinating to me. So, for example, um, one noticeable difference, I think, is the life review, whereas in the, the West, we have this life review where you kind of reflect back on your life or even relive your life in great detail. Whereas um, in cases in India, there's been reports of people meeting a man called Chitragupta, the man with the book of deeds. And in this book is a record of all of the deeds of the people's life. So it's very similar, really, to the, the life review in, in the West, but it's interpreted in a slightly different way. So there are cultural variations, and um, that's really fascinating. And I've started to get a lot of emails from people from all over the world as well. So it's great that this, e this um, information is coming in now because there's more that we can research and more questions that we can answer with these cases. Most definitely. And, and, you know, there's no standardized truth here neither in the way that people have their near-death experience. Um, would you say, though, that those who, you've met people who have had near-death experiences that have never come across or ever heard of anyone having such a, an experience before, yet they've described almost the same experience as others have told yeah. of? Absolutely. There's some people who don't even realise they've had a near-death experience. You know, it can take years for people to fully understand what's happened. And often um, I've got, like, for example, hundreds of letters from different people saying that they had this experience, didn't know what had happened, were afraid to talk about it. Yet many years later, they read a newspaper article or they watched a, a film which depicted near-death experiences and suddenly they had like an aha moment and everything clicked into place and they realised that they'd had a near-death experience and that they weren't alone because a lot of people think that they're alone. They're the only person to have this kind of experience. So they don't talk about it. So they kind of don't realise that it's a recognised phenomenon as well. So it's often quite a relief to them when they read about other people's experiences. So it can really kind of help them to understand what they've been through. And it can also help them to integrate the experience into their life. Because, you know, the near-death experience, it's not just the case of going through that tunnel towards the light or having the out-of-body experience. There's a lot of things that go with a near-death experience. So there's a multitude of after effects and it can profoundly affect people's lives after the experience. You know, their change of values, it's a drastic change. Sometimes they will change careers. Things that used to interest them no longer interest them anymore. Um, their friends, they kind of think they have nothing in common with their friends either, even with their partners. And sometimes they there can be quite a high divorce rate after a near-death experience. And sometimes people are really transformed as well in a very positive way. So there's a lot of kind of after effects. And sometimes these after effects don't often get associated with being part of the near-death experience. So, for example, some fascinating aspects can be that people feel like they have developed like a healing ability. And that is all new to them. They've never had that before. 
but they feel that they can intuitively put their hands on on an injured part of someone's body, for example, and it'll help to to speed up the healing process. So there's things like that. Some people, like last week, I, I met up with a lady, she's a midwife, actually, and she had this experience during childbirth. And ever since, it's left her with a deepened sense of intuition. But she feels like she she often goes to bed in the night and she wakes up and she's had like premonitions. And they're not of drastic things or of accidents or things like that. They can be just simple things of um, a family member doing something. And very often that will come true. And she said, it's really weird. She said, it's with me all the time. And I just get these feelings that things are going to happen. And they do happen. And she didn't realise that that could be part of her near-death experience. Also, as well, some people feel that they have these changes in their electromagnetic field. And things like their watches stop working for them for no reason. And they'll work for other people, but not for them. You know, I've spoken to hundreds of people who have actually taken their watches to a jeweller to get them repaired. And the jeweller can find nothing wrong with them at all. So there's a whole multitude of of life changes after the experience. And sometimes it can take years for these people to fully understand what has happened to them. Yeah, absolutely. And... um... Why do you think people have near-death experiences? What is it trying to tell them? Yeah, you know, a lot of people kind of think that um, once they've had the near-death experience, it's almost like they've been sent back to, to life with a mission. And very often they don't know what that mission is. And they can go searching for this mission and trying to think what it is. Um, and it's there in the back of their mind constantly. Well, maybe their mission is simply to talk about the experience and to inform the other people and the public about near-death experiences because I think you know that the message of the near-death experience is a very important one and something that we can all learn a great deal about and so I think near-death experiences tell us a lot about life as well as what the dying process can be like as well so I think you know these people have a very important message and basically what they say is that when they've had during the near-death experience they often um, describe intense feelings of unconditional deep love and they just feel this overwhelming sense of love and peace They, they sense interconnectivity with everyone and certainly during the life review they pick up on how their actions have affected people they've interacted with throughout their life. And what they kind of come back with is that what we do to others, ultimately we're doing to ourselves. And of course, that's the message of all the great wisdom traditions, and that is to treat others as you would wish to be treated yourself. And so, you know, I think they, they just have that great message for us for life. And can you imagine if everyone did treat others as they would wish to be treated themselves, how different life would be? So I think, you know, we've got a lot to learn from near-death experiences. Absolutely. And what about self-love? Does that come through at all? Yes, it does, because very often people can be very, very vulnerable before their near-death experience. You know, a few people have had the experience when they've been suicidal and they've attempted suicide. And sometimes, you know, they could be in that vulnerable, very um, low self-esteem But during the near-death experience, what they experience and what they feel gives them a totally different perspective on all of their problems and they can be transformed. Now, a a great example of this is Dr. Rajiv Party. Now, he's just written a book on his near-death experience and he was really badly depressed in the time leading up to his near-death experience. It occurred during surgery. But, you know, after his near-death experience, his depression kind of disappeared overnight. Now, you know, we we don't have any drugs that are as powerful or effective as that. And so I think if we took more time to look into the near-death experience, what is it about the near-death experience that can change someone so profoundly that gives them a completely different outlook on their life? And I think that is important. And these are important questions that we need to be asking with future research. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about information that comes through uh, when they've had a near-death experience? I mean, what is some of the most profound information that you've come across in, in terms of um, the nature of reality, maybe? 
Right. Well, there's a few different things, really. Um, sometimes they can pick up information that they weren't previously aware of. Now, I've got um, two examples I can think of off the top of my head. The first one was of um, a man in my hospital research who, during his near-death experience, had a conversation with his family member. And she said, when you go back, you tell my mother this information. So when he revived, he told her mother that information. And she was absolutely astounded that he should know that because it was something she'd gone to great lengths to keep a secret from him. I had a chat with the patient's wife and he said, yes, absolutely. She said, absolutely. There's no way he could know this information. So that was particularly interesting to me. Now, another kind of example is of a lady called Raja Benamore, and she's Moroccan. And I met her at a conference I spoke at in Marseille in France in 2013. Now, she had a near-death experience and it left her with a very deep understanding of quantum physics. Now, she'd never been taught about quantum physics before, but it was such a profound effect on her that she decided she wanted to study it at university level. So she's now studying it at the university. And in the conference, they had actually videoed her university professor. And he said, you know, he was really puzzled how she could have acquired this deep-seated knowledge. It's not something you can gain through just reading books about it or through doing a booster course. This was deep-seated knowledge. And in fact, he felt that her knowledge was beginning to get more uh, superior to his knowledge because she was writing about things in her papers which he didn't understand, but they were verified by papers that were written and published in physics journals after she'd written them. So, you know, I think that is a fascinating thing. How can someone, when their brain, when they are unconscious and their brain is physiologically insulted, how can they suddenly acquire knowledge that they've never been privy to before? So, again, that is another fascinating aspect of near-death experiences. Is there any resistance? That's what I'm trying to say, I suppose. Is there any resistance that you, mm. you come across in the sense that the near-death experience is just all within the brain? And, uh, you know, scientifically, there is no such thing as, you know, consciousness in the sense that it continues after death and was always there before death. Yeah, certainly, you know, and especially when I first started my research, it was a lot of um, cynicism and scepticism about it. And people were just kind of dismissive and just say, no, this is all due to the brain. And then actually, you know, since near death experiences have been studied in hospital studies scientifically, we're realising that actually near death experiences do happen. So they can't be dis dismissed as easy as they were. But certainly, yes, they're interpreted and research is looking to find causes. And um, there's some research recently come out, uh, Professor Stephen Laurie's. In fact, there was a, a television programme on um, National Geographic this week about it, a documentary. And it's interesting because he's done some really great research, but he's kind of come to the materialist um, conclusions about them, these experiences. So he's interpreted them from that scientific materialism and he's looking for specific areas of the brain that have kind of lit up when people have had these kinds of different aspects of the near-death experience but you know he's just looked at certain components he hasn't taken the near-death experience as a whole and he hasn't looked at the after effects as well so you know it would be great if he could take this research further and look at when he's tried to induce these experiences in the research subject if he could follow up on those research subjects to see if they've had those long lifelong changes as well so do they uh, electromagnetic fields change do they become uh, prone to having like premonitions and deepening intuition and things like that so you know there, there's two ways of um, interpreting these research conclusions and the results and basically you can look at them from the materialist point of view and look at them as being causations but you could also look at them as consciousness not being created by the brain. And perhaps when the brain lights up and these specific things are showing in the research, maybe these are just the physiological correlates of perceiving the experience rather than creating the experience. So I think it's great that we're getting all this research done now because years ago, you know, it, it was very under-researched. Not many people undertook this kind of research. So I think it's great that we're seeing more research in this field, and I hope they continue to do it. 
yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure, um, you know, there's there's so much coming through right now, isn't there? People reporting cases and, you know, even in I mean, America, it's huge. Over here, it's huge. And, and other countries are catching up now as well. Um, yeah, that's and what you find is that, you know, the general public are more vocal about their experiences now. When I started researching near-death experiences in 1995, it was really difficult to find someone who wanted to talk about their experience. They were very cautious about sharing it in case they thought I was going to laugh at them or in case I thought they were mental health issues, which is certainly not the case. And um, it's funny then because in about 2006, a national newspaper published an article on my research and I got hundreds of people um, writing to me after that. Now, when my book came out in 2014, it was serialised in a national newspaper and it had a phenomenal result. And there were people actually speaking to the newspaper and actually have uh, describing their near-death experience and having their, their photos taken and appear in the, in the newspaper again themselves. So that was a big change in attitude. And I think people are less afraid to talk about the experience now. So that is a really positive thing about the, the change in attitudes towards near-death experiences. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and has it sort of driven you to want to, for you to experience uh, this, um, uh, this, ex this reality in a sense? Have you wanted to go on your own journey and try to connect with this reality that they've, that they've gone to, to just, you know, rather than it just be all statistics and everything else for yourself, what's been your personal journey and what's been your wants to, to reconnect with what they're connecting with? Well, I've never actually done anything to intentionally induce a near-death experience, but I feel that just through studying the near-death experience, it's given me a different, totally different outlook on life and the way I live my life. And I feel in some way that I have been changed in many ways that near-death experiences describe. And it's funny because um, Professor Kenneth Ring described this back in the 1980s. He used to teach a course on um, near-death experiences. And he found that his students were changed in much the way that people who've had a near-death experience have been changed just through learning about the near-death experience. And, you know, I, I feel that that's been confirmed by my own personal um, experience of researching them. So um, he likened them to a benign virus and that once you start to get kind of engrossed in near-death experiences, it can affect you too. And certainly that's that's been my sort of experience of it. Yeah, okay. But obviously you have no fear of crossing over now when your time is due i would say i have less fear about it and i understand that death is a natural part of life and it's going to happen to myself it's going to happen to members of my family and there's, there's nothing i can do to stop it it's just a, the way life is and i think i'm not so fearful of how you know actually dying it's it's the way in which i die i guess that is there in the back of my mind more than anything but I think death itself when I'm in that deep process of death it won't be anything to fear and I think I feel more prepared for it having done the research and having contemplated my own mortality because I think before the, the research I did I'd never really thought of my own mortality but I think constantly thinking about that has given me a different perspective on what it would be like to die. Okay. And it's always very much about, I think, any near-death experience, as we've said in the interview, maybe we've said this, it's all very, almost very much about, the, you know, you, you, they seem, people seem to have them because it's the only way to shake them up, uh, to get them out of whatever pattern that they're in and, um, and to, make, to transform them into a, you know, into a person that in this lifetime could make a difference to their life and other people's. Um, and maybe they've chosen to have that experience prior to coming down here that at that particular point in their life, this experience was going to happen because their soul was ready for the growth that this experience would, 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 would cause. Yeah, that's a, way, a really interesting way of looking at it. You know, do we all elect to have these kind of experiences beforehand? And I don't know, really. And if you think about it, you know, the research shows that between about 11 and 20 percent of people who are resuscitated will have a near-death experience. 
And um, so, okay, so those 11 to 20 percent, what about the people who have no experience? You know, they don't remember anything about it. Is it simply that they just don't remember it? And um, that is something that is a very big question, really, because I've recently, um, well, about 10 years ago, a lady contacted me to say that um, she'd been attacked and it was a case of attempted murder and she was left for dead. And when she went unconscious, everything just went black. And that was it. She didn't recall anything. Now, during the attack, she'd had her nose broken. So about six months later, had to go into hospital to have that repaired. And as soon as she went under anaesthetic, she found herself back at the time of the attack. And this time when she fell to the floor unconscious, instead of having no recollection of anything, she recalled having a near death experience and going through the tunnel. So is it that we all have these experiences? most people just don't recall them and quite recently I've been in touch with a really great man called Ainsley and he again had some sort of experience when he was 13 years of age he was involved in a car accident and he was knocked over broke his leg and he was unconscious at the time now he didn't recall anything but he knew after the experience that things were different for him he couldn't quite put his finger on it but he felt different and um it's really f funny because uh, he had problems with um, his walking and his spine and things. And he went to see an osteopath and um, he was chatting with the osteopath. And um, the osteopath had been reading my book, as it happens, The Wisdom of Near-Death Experiences. And he said, have you ever thought that you might have had a near-death experience? So Ainsley read my book and everything kind of clicked into place for him. But he still had no recall of a near-death experience. And uh, he decided then that he would uh, find a therapist and he underwent some um, regression therapy. Now, when he told me this, I was a little bit cautious about it because I know I can remember many years ago reading about court being extreme caution with people being regressed to the time of an, a near-death experience because it can evoke symptoms that occurred at the time of the experience so I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend people doing this but Ainsley had had it done and when he was regressed he went back to the time of when he was a 13 year old boy and had his leg broken and he can remember that during that period when he was unconscious, he actually had a near-death experience that he only recalled when he was regressed. So that is really quite interesting to me. So maybe near-death experiences are, again, more common than we actually realise, but they're just not recalled by people. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, why would they not be recalled? Yeah, because it's um, it's the, the transformational experience that you're yearning for to... to but then again, he was a better person. That's what you're saying after that experience. Is that what you're saying? Uh, even though he didn't recall it. Yeah, he did. And he had, you know, he was deeply intuitive and things like that after. But he didn't really understand why. And he didn't know why he was different. Mm. And it was only when he read my book that things began to click into place for him. And he felt, yes, I have, you know. Yeah, so he thought, you know, yeah, maybe I did have a near-death experience and that's what motivated him then to kind of explore it further and explore the possibilities of recovering those memories. Yeah, it could, yeah, um, that's interesting. I don't, um, why did he not remember it though? Uh, that's, um, uh, yeah, who knows? Um, yeah. Un unknown. Yeah, so is, you know, is that something with the brain? Is it something that, you know, the brain kind of, it's like, I don't know, we, we really don't know enough about these experiences. So, um, you know, it's really fascinating. And of course, you know, some people after an, a cardiac arrest, for example, when NDEs are most prevalent, you know, sometimes there is a little bit of um, memory loss associated with after when they're recovering from a near death experience anyway. So perhaps it's, you know, due to perhaps a bit of brain damage as well that they don't rec uh, recall the experience. Absolutely, it could, it could it could well be it could well be it could it could be a mixture. Um, you know, maybe um, when he had that accident, it, you know, it did shut something off in his brain. And um, um, but um, you know, the, yeah, I, yeah, you, I don't know. Um, I would say though, though, that the most important, interesting aspect of all this for me is the proof, potentially, that 
the consciousness that's who we are, that when we look in that mirror and say, I'm aware of I am, I'm aware of my reflection, that awareness um, is, is more than my brain producing that awareness, producing the consciousness. That consciousness has always been and always will be and was well, was here before this body and, 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 and will continue afterwards maybe in another life um, somewhere else. And it's, it's looking at the potential of where the consciousness goes to, what, the, mm -hmm. what this reality there, therefore is, um, how we can make this reality better by bringing in teaching information from that state where the consciousness goes back to and came, to, came from. Well, yes, if we look at consciousness as being non-local, and that would be the case where consciousness is primary and it's around us all the time. And, um, you know, if we look at consciousness as being primary, everything changes and we have a completely different way on uh, the view on life, um, how we react with other people and how we interact with, react and interact with the planet as well, you know, because people realise during this state that we're all in interconnected and that what we do to others, we, it comes back on ourselves. And also what we're doing to the planet, they look at the wider picture and, you know, they can see the, the effect and the impact that human behaviour is having on the planet and how we are actually destroying the planet. So, you know, we have a whole different way of how we live life then because people who have this experience are very mindful of how they react, interact with the earth as well and they adopt much more eco-friendly behavior as well and it's something that you know we we kind of don't think about really mo most of the time most people don't think about the impact that we're having on the planet so it's a it's a big thing that concerns our evolution as a human race but also the evolution of the planet as well do you think the near-death experience is set up in a way that uh, those who are very intellectual on this planet and you know would have no um, belief, um, no truth in, in life continuing um, when when they um, when it finishes, um, and that uh, they are more than their body? Do you think it's it, an intellectual way? To, uh, it's there for intellectuals to to pursue then or to see from a different stance points that consciousness does continue and has you know and 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 is the true nature of what we are therefore if there weren't cases like the the near-death experiences then it wouldn't help those who are really rigid into science to to come out of that space and and and, and to look at something that may be greater and, and, and beyond this reality that there's certain things set up in life to just help us to re-remember sometimes, and uh, for the you know, because our, our others who are quite open-minded um, wouldn't need to experience an uh, or, or to be too bothered about the near-death experiences because they may have their own psychic abilities or they may be able to connect to the higher self through different ways. But others, the intellectuals, um, you know, that have or have shut that side of them down. This is a way forward for them. Yeah, well, you think about it, you know, intellectuals are, are highly conditioned into the materialist way of thinking. And so anything that does not fit in those realms, they kind of dis discount. And, you know, things like um, anything that can't be measured is kind of not considered to be real. And I think that is a great downfall, really, because it kind of discounts human experience itself as well. And there's, there was a great case, actually, that I talk about in What is a Near-Death Experience of the philosopher A.J. Ayer. And um, he had a near-death experience himself. He was in hospital and he choked on a piece of salmon. And after his experience, it changed his views on everything. And uh, so that was really quite interesting because he ha actually had the experience himself. He kind of, a few months after that, he retracted that those views. But I think initially, his initial thoughts had changed greatly. So, you know, it's really interesting when people actually have the experience, how it can change their, their minds as well. A absolutely. When I asked you that question earlier on about... Um, how, you know, how have you uh, have you wanted to go beyond just the facts and figures and try to have your own experience? And I, and I, di I didn't mean for you to have a, a you know for you to physically have a near death experience. What I meant is, have you dabbled with anything else to try to connect with this greater yeah. reality? 
Yeah, I tell you what has been become part of my spiritual practice is to take time for myself every day, even if it's just 10, 15 minutes, just to meditate, because that has had such a profound effect on helping me deal with a busy life. And, you know, things are really busy. I work full time. I got a little bit. My, my son is two years old. Plus, I'm doing all my NDE research in my spare time. So, you know, things are so busy and I I find that when I take that time to meditate, it just completely calms everything down for me and it gives me that lovely perspective on things again. So I think if if I wasn't to meditate, I think I'd probably crack up, to be honest with you. So that is a big thing that I've kind of done as a result of doing my research and I think it's it's such a great practice and mindfulness and things like that it's it's very important and I consider it to be very important part of my life well through meditation um you know lots of doors can open and also I think that's a great practice for yourself to be doing that um especially as you say being as busy as you are right now um yeah well then all I can say is meditation is for myself has been a way into that greater reality. You know, all I do in, in meditation is practically just, you know, form a door, a picture of a door in my head, walk through that door, and then I'm connected to something greater than myself, greater than this body. I don't know if you mm-hmm. have tried that before. Yes, I do. I do uh, meditations like that. Um, and that Those are really powerful and effective. And I also do yoga nidra meditations, and I think they're really great Ah. for me. Um, Group meditation as well. It could be nice if it's done in a group, and I find it's it's often very powerful when it's done in a group. Right. And, um, yeah, it's, it's just great. And I think... At one point in my life, when I before I had my son, I had a lot of time on my hands because I'd given up nursing and I wasn't working at all. It was just doing my NDE research. And so I had some time where I could meditate and I took the time to meditate three or four times a day for 20 minutes in the morning, 45 minutes lunchtime, 45 minutes in the evening. And that had a real profound effect on on my life as well. So um, it, I felt uh, myself, I felt more intuitive with things simply through doing that research. And I felt I was more open to other people. And um, yeah, it, it was it was a very nice and calming time in my life. And that's when I, I was re- writing my book, actually, The, the Wisdom of Near-Death Experiences. So it, it helps greatly with that to cl- clarify my thoughts as well. Oh, that's interesting. OK. And that's come from, obviously, all this research and, and the years you've spent doing this. Well, that's that's very interesting. Um, yes. Well, there's there's your journey. There's your journey there, definitely. Um, mm-hmm. OK. Well... What can we ask that could be really interesting? Because you've got to understand, guys, just for this interview, I've got no questions for this. So I'm going (laughs) free flow on this completely. (laughs) So, um, And that's mainly because I've got another interview just a bit later on. And it's just a lot of work right now uh, keeping up with it all. I can Um, talk about the future, really, what I've got planned for that, if you want. Well, yeah, actually, that was a question I had, actually, earlier. uh, You just reminded me because I wanted to ask you as well. Yeah. Definitely about the future, but also um, I wanted to ask you, um, what is the future of, of, of near-death experience research? Is it just to keep compiling case after case after case, or is there a new direction that it can go in? Well, that's interesting because, yes, I, it is a case of getting more uh, cases. And I think if it's done in a hospital setting as well, we're going to get more uh, significant cases But I think it's really important to study aspects of near-death experiences as well and and ask the questions, why is it that some people feel that they can heal after the experience? Is there some way that we can learn about that? Can, Can we measure it, for example? I think it would be very difficult to measure it, but is there some sort of way that we could understand that better so that we could apply that in healthcare settings? Um, why is it that people's electromagnetic field changes after a near-death experience? Is there something to do with consciousness and electromagnetism, which would then give us a deeper understanding of consciousness? And so there's so many different things that we can look at um, aspects and kind of take these aspects apart and look at those and ask new research questions as well. 
So I think, you know, it's important that we continue with hospital research. And indeed, the AWARE project is, is still ongoing. And, you know, they, they're finding some great results from that as well. So I hope that continues for many more years because there's such a lot of a wealth of information that we're gathering through that. When you, when you um, in, um, get to interview people that have had near-death experiences, is there any um, re- re- recollection of um, spiritual truths coming through? You know, do they get chance to, uh, in the sense of um, teaching information that can come through from the other side, that's given to them by light beings or given to them by highly evolved beings that they meet on, on this platform or in, in this space that they go to? Yes, and in fact, I've uh, spoken to somewhere quite a few people recently who feel that they have, um, they connect with guides or angels in their experience, and they feel that they develop an ongoing relationship with the guides and their angels, and they particularly strengthen those connections through meditation and things, and they ver- are very much guided in their life, and they can do things that they they perhaps. Um, started off spiritual practices and used those to benefit other people as well so there's one lady in america who's developed like a healing practice and she's she set up this healing business and people come to her and they feel very much um it it helps them in their life a great deal so you know a lot of people do still feel connection with the, the guides that they meet in the experience not everyone but but some people certainly feel very guided throughout the rest of their life as well that's interesting yeah absolutely and as you just mentioned that case there um is that a key thing that comes through from the near death experience in the sense that really it's to be of service Yes, that's you've just put the words into my mouth. That's exactly what I was going to say. You know, people do feel that they change and that they want to be of service to others as a result of their experience. And, you know, previously they may have been really self-centered people and never given other people a second thought. But very often the experience drastically changes their life and they want to be of service to others. For example, there's one man I'm in email communication with now and he lives a phenomenally busy life and he was working, you know, really long hours and he had his near-death experience and it's left him with lots of after effects. But one of them is he feels that he really has a lot to offer people who are dying and he wants to go and do some hospice work so that he can be with people who are afraid as they're dying so he can put their minds at ease so he's currently looking into ways of how he can go into hospice working and you know he he wants to take time out of his busy life and go and sit with people to be of service to people so he can help them out as they're preparing to die yeah, isn't that a beautiful thing? And 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 by helping others in that perspective, he's also helping them. Well, they're helping themselves because do you think in after the near death experience they find purpose? Yes, absolutely. Yes, they do. They come back and they know that they have a life purpose and they know that they're here for a reason. Sometimes they can be looking for that reason for a long time. But and that's, I've got a great example that's just popped into my mind now. Um, in 2006, a lady emailed me after a newspaper article and she said, I've had this beautiful experience and it was amazing and I really wanted to stay there. And But she said, I, I was sent back and I know I've been sent back for a reason and I really don't know what that reason is. Now, when my second book came out in 2014, she got in contact with me again and she said, um, I know what that reason was for me coming back. She said, um, four years ago, my husband was diagnosed with a terminal illness. And as he was dying, I was able to be with him. I was able to talk him through it. I was able to give him a different perspective on life and death. And it really did help with his dying process. And he had a very peaceful and calm death. And she said, I know now in my deep down that that is why I came back to life. And so to her, that was, you know, that was a real, that was her purpose in life. And, you know, she continues to be of service to other people. Now, isn't that amazing that uh, it doesn't need to be on a, on a huge platform. It doesn't need to be changing the world. It was just changing his world. 
that she did. It was just yeah. to be with him. And that was yeah. just as important as any big events going on. Absolutely, yes. Interesting, very interesting. Well, it just goes to show, doesn't it? Your purpose, you could, being a mum could be your purpose. It is, it is a purpose, isn't it? <laughs> right, absolutely, yes. You, you're so right there. It doesn't have to be anything elaborate or drastic. It can just be simply being who you are. And and and, but if there's other things that you want to do, and you find that to be the draw to your purpose, then that's what you've got to do. But as you've just said, that lady as well. You know, it took her a lifetime to to figure that out. Mm. Yes, absolutely. It, it yes. didn't come overnight. If I was to ask you right now, um, your purpose, would you? Would are you still on the journey of finding it, or it, 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 do you think it's doing what you're doing? Yeah, I, I really feel that it's very strongly correlated with near-death research because, you know, the way it all happened and there were a series of synchronicities that happened in the lead-up to the to it. And since I've committed to doing the research, everything has just kind of fallen into place for me. And where there could have been obstacles appearing, they've kind of disappeared. So my path has been straightforward. You know, it's been a lot of hard work. But it doesn't feel like hard work either. It feels like I'm doing something for a hobby. So it's been an absolutely incredible journey. And I really feel 100% that my life purpose is doing near-death experience research, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I feel that for you. But just as you were saying those words, most definitely that, uh, you know, when you were saying about, you know, the synchronicity and that how your life just flowed with what you're doing. You, yeah, it, it has, hasn't it? It's been an incredible journey. You know, as I said at the beginning of the show, you know, I, I was a bit shocked that there was another book straight out. Um, um, to you, I'm guessing it doesn't feel like straight away. Do you know what I mean? Because it's, so much has been going on. But to be doing all you're doing and another book, but that, 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 that's, that, that just shows that, yes, it's a lot of work, but it's not, as you said, because you're in tune, you're in flow with what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, it feels like that. But I think because I'm getting so many cases of near-death experiences now, I can't really deal with all the emails that I get. That is a problem. And so I've got... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I'm looking to employ a research assistant who lives locally to me, and I'm hoping I'm going to find a student nurse in the Swansea area who is actually interested in being a research assistant and helping me with, with this. And then I'm thinking long term, that student nurse may even want to do her own research in the hospital as well. So it would be great, you know, if there's any student nurses out there who are interested in helping out, that would be great to get in touch with me. Well, you never know. Well, I mean, you've touched a lot of lives with your books and you'll never quite know, will you, just exactly who's read them and what effect it's had. Um, and it's just the same with the person that you're going to be working with uh, very soon as well in, 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 in the case of the research or the right person, shall I say, that you'll work with in the end. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're going to touch their, their life as well with, with, with this. It's, it's incredible, how, isn't it, how everything's connected? Yes, absolutely, definitely is. And, and you know, because the way my life has changed, I feel like I've been... I was so empowered by having done this research and the happiness that I feel as a result of doing it, it would be great if everyone in the world could feel this fulfilled and satisfied and happy with their life as well, you know. So, um, yeah, I think engaging with near-death experiences has been a really beneficial thing in my life. So is there, you know, we, we spoke about um, your future plans as well, but is what, what else are you working on? Well, um, I'm currently writing another book at the moment, and this book is going to be a little bit different because it's going to be a collaboration of many different people who had a near-death experience, and they are going to produce their own chapter. Um, I'm going to be writing it with someone called Kelly Walsh, who has had an experience herself, and in fact, Kelly's been a very big driving force in, in doing this book. And it's going to be on the transformational aspects of near-death experiences and how people are transformed by the experience and what they do in their life after the experience. So we're hoping that's going to be out in 2018. And we're currently working on it very hard at the moment. So, uh, so keep your eyes open for that book as well.
Okay, well, I can't wait to get you back on for that. But that, that's that's a pretty cool way of doing it, actually, from, you know, from them actually having their own chapter in there. And um, as you say, there's just so many ways to present this material. Um, are, are there any sort of researchers out there in, in this field that, that you look up to or that inspire you? Oh, yes, there's loads of people in the in the uh, field of near-death experiences who I really look up to. You know, there's people like Professor Bruce Grayson in America has done a phenomenal amount of work. He's written so many articles and extensively researched these experiences. You know, there's Dr. Peter Fennick, who was my supervisor, Dr. Uh, Professor Paul Badham, another of my supervisors, um, David Lorimer of the Scientific and Ned- Medical Network, who was one of the pioneers in this field as Professor Kenneth Ring. You know, you look at them all, Dr. Raymond Moody, look at them all who have done this really phenomenally important research. There's Dr. Pim Van Lommel. There are just so many people out there. And I, there's loads more that I haven't mentioned, you know. So I think everyone who's done research in this field has done incredibly important work. So I look up to them all, absolutely. Yeah, and it, and it all points, doesn't it? It's still I've still got to bang on about this. It all points to we are more than our body. We are not we are not contained within our body in a sense where the consciousness is not local. It seems to be, which is a, which is a huge mm-hmm. one to get your head around because how can it not be? But <laughs> let's just face it. When yeah. you know when I as I've said before, when you look in that mirror and you're aware of your awareness, to me it's always seemed greater than my brain giving me that awareness I've, I can't I don't know how or why I say that it just it seems to you know the being conscious is something undescribable isn't it I mean even in the dictionary you know I look at it sometimes and I'm thinking well that's not I, I don't define my consciousness by those words it's beyond that you know to be aware yeah. of, of to, to, for the awareness to be aware of, of itself that's that's yeah, the thing that's isn't right. it Exactly, yeah. And, you know, I think we've been so conditioned into the belief that consciousness is produced by the brain, that you know, that, that's deeply ingrained. And so yeah. it, it's very difficult to consider consciousness from an, a different aspect of being non-local. But that's what really makes most sense to me. You know, if consciousness is primary, the brain would act like a mediator or a filter rather than a creator of consciousness. And I think the brain then kind of acts like this filter but there are times in the person's life when that filter action relaxes so rather than screening out this consciousness which is allowed around us all the time all it does during a near-death experience is because the brain is dysfunctional the filter action relaxes and it allows this deeply altered state of consciousness to be perceived whereas it wouldn't be perceived normally And then when you look at near-death experiences from that perspective, there is absolutely nothing paranormal about them. There's nothing supernatural about them. It is what you would actually expect to happen. And so I think that, you know, there's many different routes to access in this experience. But of course, you know, some people would take sort of drugs like LSD and some people have reported similar experiences Some people have had peak experiences during meditation, for example, and again reported similar experiences to the near-death experience. And I think the setting and the context when you, you know, when you um, do meditation, you have some form of expectation of what you're going to have, you know, uh, what sort of experience you'll have. Again, when you take drugs like LSD, you have expectation of what it's going to be like. But with a near-death experience, It happens out of the blue. You can't plan to have the experience. It's something that happens very unexpectedly. So I think, you know, when that happens, then it's a totally overwhelming experience. And I think rather than the brain creating anything, all it's doing is allowing this altered or this deep state of consciousness to be perceived, whereas normally it's blocked out by the brain. That makes most sense to me anyway. No, no, no. I, I, I love what you're saying there. It makes a lot of sense to me. And um, I think ayahuasca is another way as well that people have been doing for a while now. Uh, as, as, as I'm... Yeah, so, you know, all the, the indigenous tribes have been doing this throughout their culture, you know, throughout their history. And it's a way of keeping in touch with uh, the greater sense of consciousness. And, you, you know, you look at indigenous cultures, you know, they are very respectful of the land as well as other people as well. So, you know, 
there's a lot can be said by accessing these deep altered state of consciousness. Absolutely. And I know we're almost out of time here as well. One thing I will say to you as well is that, um, you know, I look at the world right now and I, th I see the pain that it's in um, on, on so many different levels. Yet, um, I think when you're in when you're in connection with your purpose, just as you are, you go out and make the world as best you can be you can to make that difference in the world um, because that's what your teaching of the near-death experience does you know the compassion the, the 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 love that comes from you know looking into this work the you know, you know um, th that we are all one the connection that we all have with each other um, so my, my point is really is that when just to show people that when you're in alignment with with that which which is true for you um, purpose um, or with what you love you do automatically send ripple effects out to the world to, 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 to heal it as well so you may not have gone out there penny you know to, to change the world but in a sense what you do does because of the 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 information that you're you're putting out there do you see what i mean yeah yeah absolutely yeah and i feel like um i, I feel i've really changed myself more than anything you know and I, it was you know changing myself which has been such a powerful thing for me yeah and th that's right We're, um uh, uh, and that should not be discounted at all i think that's another point as well is that when you change yourself uh, it has an effect on those around you as well. You can't, you can't, ha you know, that, that's just nat. Have you not noticed that? That's a natural side effect. Yes, yeah, that's right. It does, yes. And everything, you're right, everything does flow as well then, you know, everything, life just kind of literally does yeah, flow. Yeah. Now, uh, your book is available, obviously, from all good bookstores um, and online as well. So, um, oh, and just, just your website as well, Penny. Yes, it's www.drpennysartori.com. Okay, well, we've been putting that um, up with the book throughout the interview as well. Um, what would you say is a, just a final brief message you might want to give to the audience? Um, I, would say, I would say, you know, really engage with near-death experiences. And a lot of us have a lot of preconceptions about what they are but you know take the time to really look at them in depth find someone who's had an experience and go and chat with them and find out you know think about things and question everything but have an open mind as well and I think consider your own mortality and think about what near-death experiences can teach us about life and um, you know don't be afraid of death but embrace it as the natural part of life that it is Absolutely. Well, Dr. Penny Satari, just thank you so, so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you, Kevin. Well, we've come to an end on today's show. Don't forget that you can listen and watch all our past interviews on the More Show's official YouTube channel. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new daily shows. You may also find out more on all past and upcoming guests on the show via themoreshow.com and do like us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates. So until next time, be safe.